a very good morning to you all. Today we'll be looking into uh, two topics, which is most important. One is aseptic precaution and techniques before any procedures or any, um, I mean, for example, uh, even starting with a uh, extracting a blood sample from a patient, taking this, uh, analyzing the specimen or analyzing of any um, materials like uh, urine samples or whatever it is, and also handling the surgical patient preoperatively and postoperatively. And, and one more topic is that, which is closely related with this, this that is most important, surgical site infection, that is very much important in the postoperative patients. So first we'll go into a topic, aseptic precautions and technique to be followed during every procedure. So what do you mean by aseptic technique? Aseptic technique refers to a procedure that is performed under sterile conditions. This includes medical and laboratory techniques which deal with the cultures and human cells and tissue for transplantations and other procedures also. So what is the aim of the aseptic technique? The fundamental aim is to prevent the access of microorganisms during the preparation, testing or transformation into another material or another any other to transfer the uh, specimen from one place to another place or from one container to another container or whatever. So in the microbiology lab, we use aseptic techniques to, to prevent the contamination of the specific microorganism we are working with and to prevent the contamination of the room and the person with the microorganism we are working with. So these are the basic principles of the aseptic technique. So, we wonder how the source of contamination can be. So there are various sources for contamination, starting from the surroundings till we, how we handle. So the listed out sources of contamination are first and foremost is the atmosphere, the surrounding that is, and the breath, and the hands we use while, uh, while doing the procedures, and the clothing which we wore during the procedures, the hand which will be completely covered during the procedures and the working surface which has to be sterilized enough in order to prevent the microorganism and the equipment which is to be highly sterilized before introducing off or operating or introducing into the patient. So these are the basic things which can lead to source of contamination and which can be easily avoided in order to prevent the contamination. So what are the various techniques we employ for the in aseptic precaution? The first one we are going to look into is sterilization technique. So it is a process by which article, surface, or medium is made free from all the microorganisms, either in the vegetative or the spore state. And the next one, the next one is disinfection. It is a process by which an article, surface, or the medium is made free from all the pathogenic microorganisms, that is, organisms that are capable of giving rise to infection. And one more thing is the antisepsis. So during this process, it is a process by which the growth of bacteria is inhibited, but they are not killed. So to say frank, it is like arresting the action of the bacteria, but the bacteria is still alive. So what need to be sterilized in the process of aseptic technique? So culture media, fluids used in the labs, reagents, laboratory containers and laboratory equipments. So these are the basic things which has to be sterilized in the process of the aseptic technique. So method of the methods of sterilization. The first one is a physical method, which is the first one, a dry heat method, which is done by the hot air oven, for example, done for the glassware. And, and then flaming technique, which is done for inoculation of inoculation loops and needles. The second one is the moist heat, which is steam under high pressure. Most commonly done pressure is the autoclaving, for example, the culture media. And the filtration, which is used for heat sensitive liquids like antibiotic solutions and serum. And for radiation, 
which is used for enclosed areas such as inoculation rooms and virus labs. So the chemicals which are commonly used for yeah, sterilization are alcohol, which is the which is used commonly for the surface cleaning and the skin. Example, ethyl alcohol or 70% concentration is commonly employed in sterilizing the surface and the skin before the surgery. And aldehyde, example, formaldehyde, equipment such as centrifuge, which is commonly used. And the phenolics, which is commonly employed in cleaning the floors, walls, and benches of the lab or OT. So coming to the general principles of the aseptic technique. So disinfect the area before starting to reduce the potential contaminants on the bench top and after work is finished to protect other, others from possible contamination. And the second principle is flame the inoculating loop before and after making a transfer of bacteria from one container to another container. And never lay any inoculating loop on the bench top if you are not sure if it has been flamed first. When in doubt, flame the loop again. And the flame the opening of the glass container before removing bacteria from them and again after bacteria have been re removed. Likewise, the flame the opening before transferring the bacteria to a container and again after the transfer is completed. And the fourth point is, do not lay the cap of the containers of the bacteria on the bench top while bacteria are removed from or transferred to the container. The cap should remain under your control throughout the transfer. So this is to ensure there is a high chances of spillage in order to avoid high chances of spillage and the errors. And the fifth one is work quickly and efficiently to minimize the time the culture is exposed to the environment. So obviously we all know the more the time exposed the bacteria, the more we have a chance of acquiring it. So when there is a minimal chances, then when there's a minimal time of handling the bacteria and the container or the specimen or the culture, whatever we use, there is less chances that we acquire it. So we, and also we will be safer enough. So these all constitute the aseptic techniques. Next, we'll go to the surgical site infection. So coming to the surgical infection and the prevention. So surge, what is mean by surgical site infection? It is an infection that occurs after the surgery in the part of the body where the surgery took place. Usually a surgical site infection can sometimes be superficial infection involved in the skin only. Other surgical site infections are more serious and can involve tissues under the skin, organs or implanted material. So the coach laid down the list, the, laid down the first definition of the infective disease. Coach postulated proving whether a given organism is cause of a given disease, which are, it must be found in, a, in every case. It should be possible to isolate it from the host and grow it in a culture. It should reproduce the disease when injected into another healthy host, and it should be recovered from an experimental infected host. So the surgical site infection patient who have contaminated wounds, who are immunosuppressed and who are undergoing prosthetic surgery is now the exception rather than the rule since the introduction of prophylactic antibiotics. The use of antibiotics in clean non-prosthetic is of less value as infection rates are low and the indiscriminate use of antibiotics simply encourages the emergence of resistant stains of bacteria. The common bacteria causing surgical site infection are the first and foremost, what we commonly encounter 
in the post-operative period is streptococcus. Is it gram positive? Important is beta hemolytic streptococcus, which resides in the pharynx for five to ten percent of population. Streptococcus pathogens are most pathogenic, which has the ability to cause cellulitis tissue tissue destruction by releasing streptolysin, streptokinase, and streptodermis. So streptococcus pyrogens and fecalis usually involve in infection after large bowel surgery. Usually, sensitive, usually these are sensitive to penicillin and erythromycin, cephalosporin being the alternative who are allergic to penicillin. The second one is staphylococcus, which is a gram-positive. Staphylococcus aureus is the most important pathogen in this group found in nasopharynx, causes separation in the wound and around the implanted prosthesis. Meter medicine resistant streptococcus aureus are resistant to many common antibiotics and are difficult to treat. Staph saints are usually resistant to penicillin but sensitive to cephalosporin, vancomycin, and flucloxacillin. Staph epidermis is regarded as a pathogenic commensal organism commonly found on skin. Usually, the staphylococcus epidermis are usually commonly, I mean, it is commonly found in the catheter sites, IV cannula sites, urinary catheter sites. So, these are the common places from where the staph epidermis can occur. And the third one is Clostridia, which is a gram posture, produces resistant spore. Clostridium perfringens is the cause of gas gangrene and Clostridium tetani causes tetanus after implantation into a tissue or a wound. The Clostridium deficiency is a cause of a pseudomembranous colitis where destruction of the normal colonic bacteria flora by antibiotic therapy allow an overgrowth of normal gut commensal. Clostridium deficiency leads to pathologic levels. These, these kind of organisms are usually treated with metronidazole or vancomycin. So what are the commonest and natural barriers which protect against an infection? The, which is like a, for a normal patient or for the surgical patient. So normal, normal and natural barriers which we consider are chemical, which is low gastric pH, and humoral, which are considered to be antibodies, complement, and obstruction. And the cellular levels, phagocytic cells, macrophages, polymorphonuclear cells, and killer lymphocytes. Coming to the classification of surgical site infection, it is based on the source of infection. So endogenous, endogenous, which is present in or on the host. Example, superficial surgical site infection following contamination of the wound from the perforated appendix and comes to the exogenous, which is an acquired from a source of outside the body, such as operating theater which is inadequate air filtration or, or from the instruments, unsterilized or improperly sterilized instrument or the war, poor hand washing techniques. These are the common causes which is labeled as exogenous, which can be avoided easily in order to prevent from surgical site infection to the patient. The cause of hospital acquired infection, these. Factor that determine whether a wound will become infected or not. So the list of things which will decide, which we can predict before patient getting serious illness due to a surgical site infection. The first and foremost is the host response and virulence and inoculum of the infective agent, vascularity and health of tissue being invaded, presence of dead or foreign tissue, presence of antibiotic during decessive period. So, what does it mean by decessive period? It is up to four hours interval before bacteria growth becomes established enough to cause an infection after a breach into the tissue, whether caused by a trauma or a surgery. So this is called a decessive period. So what are the risk factors for increased risk of wound infection? So the list are, the first and foremost thing is the malnutrition of the patient, which has a, uh, which when the patient has a poor ability, poor malnutrition, obviously the patient will have a difficulty in overcoming the disease or a, any infection which he is acquired. And then the metabolic disease, for example, diabetes mellitus is the most common cause of metabolic disease, which causes poor and delayed wound healing. And the immunosuppressions, 
patients, for example, HIV patients are more prone of increased risk of getting wound infected. And the colonization and translocation into GAT, poor, poor tissue perfusion, and foreign body, which is in the wound, causes a poor high risk of contamination. Therefore, going for a wound infection and the poor surgical technique, which can be prevented easily. So, how a presentation, how a surgical site infection will present? Infection acquired from the environment or the staff following surgery or admission to the hospital is termed as hospital acquired infection. There are four main groups respiratory tract infection, urinary tract infection bacteremia and the surgical site infection. So coming to the major and minor surgical site infection. So what is termed as major surgical site infection? Major surgical site infection is defined as a wound that either discharges significant quantities of pus spontaneously or needs a secondary procedure through dating. For example, incision drainage in case of pus collection in the surgical site wound. So in order to in order to relieve the pus and to clean the wound and to heal and to leave the wound healed, pus has to be pus or any materials foreign body or any implanted material which is inside or any um, for like dead tissues or osteomyelitic or a osteomyelitic bone has to be removed in order to heal the site. And minor wound infection is termed as Discharge it, the, the wound that discharges pus or infected serious fluid but are not associated with excessive discomfort, systemic signs, or delay in return to home. So, the major surgical site infection always carries it gives an extreme discomfort to the patient. System, systemic signs like a tachycardia, fever will be present, and there will be a prolonged hospital stay in order to recover from the infection. So, they also are termed as a major. And just opposite to that, we consider it as a minor. So minor infection usually presents with a locally, local site pain with the erythematous skin, cellulitic area. So these are the local signs which can be termed as a minor wound infections. So these are the scoring system for you know, to label the severity of the wound infection. The first one is the asepsis wound score system. So any additional, in this criteria, any additional treatment given should be, will be counted as a point. So antibiotics for a wound infection is given a 10 points and drainage of pus under local anesthesia is given a five points and debridement of wound under general anesthesia is given 10 points. And so the A stands for additional treatment and comes to the S. S is nothing but the serious discharge daily for zero to five days and then the E. E stands for the erythema, which is counted from day 0 to 5, and the purulent exudate, which is counted from day from 0 to 10 days, and separation of deep tissues, which is which is calculated from daily from 0 to 10, and isolation of bacteria from the womb, that is given as 10 points. And stay as inpatient prolonged over 14 days as a result of wound infection, that is calculated from as a 0.5. So the serous discharge, erythema, purulent exudate, separate or separation of deep, deep tissues every day accounts to 0 to 5. We are graded, the, uh, given a point like 0 to 5. For example, serous discharge and the erythema. And for the purulent and the separation of a deep, purulent exudate and the separation of deep tissues on daily basis, is this points given from 0 to 10. And the stay as an inpatient prolonged for over 14 days as a result of wound infection given as five points. The score of five of the first seven days only, the remainder being scored is present in the first two months. So the A sub six wound score for each and every word from the A to the S, A, S, E, P, S, I, S has its own derivations. Coming to the next wound grading system, which is a Southampton wound grading system. So it is graded from based on the appearance and based on the major complications. So appearance, when the normal healing is seen, it is given as grade zero. And the grade one is defined as normal healing with a mild bruising or erythema. And the grade one A is termed as 
some bruising present in the surgical site. And 1B is considerable bruising noted. And the 1C is mild erythematous changes noted. And the grade 2 is erythema, erythema plus, organ, plus other signs of inflammation. And 2A is at one point, 2B is around the suture site, 2C is along the wound, along the length of the wound, and 2D is around the wound, which is spread it to from the wound to the to little far away from the wound. And the grade 3 is clear or hemosphere's distance. And the grade 3A is at one point only, which is less than 2 centimeters. And grade 3B is termed as along the wound, which is more than 2 centimeters. And the grade 3C is large volume. Grade 3D is prolonged, for which is more than for three days. And the grades followed by the major complication. The four, the grade 4 is termed as a pus collection. 4A is termed as at one point, which is less than 2 centimeter. 4B is along the wound, which is more than 2 centimeter. And grade 5 is deep or severe wound infection with or without tissue breakdown. Hematoma requires aspiration. So these are the Southampton wound grading system. So how we consider the wound localized wound? So what are the localized wounds? Abscess. So it's a clinical feature of acute inflammation. Commonest pyogenic organism is staphylococcus aureus, which causes tissue necrosis and separation. Abscess related to surgery most commonly occur only after seven to 10 days of post-op period. The persistent chronic abscess may sometimes lead to sinus or fistula formation and most common organs responsible is mycobacterium and actinomyces. So, and comes the cellitis and the lymphangitis. These are non separative invasive infections of the tissues, which is usually related to point of injury. The commonest organism responsible is beta hemolytic streptococcus, staphylococcus, and clostridium perfringens. And the systemic signs, which is caused, which are which can which can uh, which which are evident during this infection are chills and rigor, fever, and presenting complaints. Are presenting complaints. So, lymphangitis is a part of a similar process and presents as a painful red streaks in, in affected lymphatics, draining the source of infection. And the viral infection relevant to the surgery. There are certain viral infections which has to be considered in the post-operative period for the wound healing. The first one is hepatitis. It carries a high risk to patient and the surgeon as it can get transmitted from the patient to a doctor or vice versa. So, and the mode of transmission is blood to blood contact, needle stick injury or a cut is more than enough to occur a hepatitis. And comes the HIV. The type 1 HIV is the one of the virus of surgical importance because it can be transmitted by body fluids, particularly through the blood. After exposure, the virus binds to CD4 cells. The T helper cells and other cells involved in the cell mediated immunity antibody production and delayed hypersensitivity. Macrophages and gut associated lymphoid tissue are also affected. These patients have a high risk of opportunistic infection, that is pneumocystic kidney, tuberculosis, cytomegalovirus, and neoplasm such as Kaposi's sarcoma and lymphoma. So how will you prevent a surgical site infection? Three important points which has to be followed in order to prevent the surgical site infection are listed here. The first one is preoperative preparation, which includes bathing of the, uh, bathing of the, and uh, asking the patient to bath prior to the procedure and cleaning their skin with antiseptic liquids, shaving the site of the surgery. So these compress and any other, and few more things apart from that. And scrubbing and skin preparation, which also has a major point, I mean, a major part in avoiding the surgical site infection and the prophylactic antibiotics. So these three major things are mandatory in order to reduce the surgical site infection. The role of the antibiotics in prevention of surgical site infection. 
for preoperative antibiotics prophylaxis proved to reduce the risk of postoperative surgical site infection in many circumstances, whereas it does not protect post-op nosocomial infections. Antibiotics are usually indicated only for clean contaminated and contaminated surgeries. Antibiotic prophylaxis in clean surgery is controversial. For example, hernia and fibroadenoma of breast. In these cases, antibiotic profile is still in a query. Though arterial is a reconstruction with a prostatic graft in the example of a clean surgery, the risk of acquiring infection is high, especially if the graft is taken from an infrainguinal region. And prophylactic antibiotics were proved to be highly efficacy in reducing surgical site infection by approximately 75% and graft rejection by 69%. Four principles guides the administration of antibiotic antimicrobial agent for prophylaxis. First one is a safety. Second, an appropriate narrow spectrum of coverage of relevant pathogen. Third, little or no reliance on the agent for therapy of infection because of the possible induction of resistance with heavy use. Four, administration within one hour before the surgery and for, for a defined brief period thereafter. Not longer than 24 hours, 48 hours for cardiac surgery and ideally a single dose. Most of the surgical site infection are caused by gram-positive coffee. So prophylaxis should be directed primarily against the cephalococci. Usually, first-generation staphylosporin is preferred in almost all circumstances with clindamycin for penicillin allergic COVID cases. If gram-negative coverage needed, the metronidazole would be the first choice of drug. Vancomycin can be preferred only for the MRS medicine-resistant staphylococcus aureus positive cases. And if the antibiotic has a short half-life, example less than two hours, it should be redosed every three to four hours if the surgery is prolonged or bloody. Coming to the principles of antibiotic therapy. Evaluation of possible infection. The signs are like fever, hypertension, tachycardia, tachypnea, confusion, rigors, skin lesions, respiratory manifestation, oliguria, lactic acidosis, leukocytosis, leukopenia, immature neutrophils or thrombocytopenia. These may indicate a workup for infection and immediate empirical therapy. When it comes to a fever, the definition of fever is arbitrary and depends on how and when the temperature was measured. In addition to the host biology, a variety of environmental forces in an ICU can alter blood temperature such as specialized mattress, lightning, heating, or air conditioning in the room, and the peritoneal lavage and the renal replacement therapy also contribute to the alteration in the temperature of the patient. The thermoregulatory mechanism can be disrupted by drugs or even by injury to the central nervous system. So these are things has to be kept in the mind in order before a patient has been labeled he has a fever. Drug fever is usually in surgical patient and must be considered a diagnosis of exclusion. Some drug causes fever by producing local infusion, site inflammation, such as amphotericin B, potassium chloride, and erythromycin. Some drug causes heat production, for example, thyroxine, limit heat dissipation, example atropine and epinephrine, or alter the thermoregulation, example like antihistamines and anti parkinsonism drugs. Drug fever in surgical site ICUs is most often arbitrated to antimicrobial agent and anticonversants. But the malignant hypothermia is an alarming condition which is, gen which is genetically determined response mediated by a dysregulation of a cytoplasmic calcium flux in skeletal muscle, resulting in intense muscle contraction, fever, and increased creatine kinase concentration, which can 
be of due to succinyl choline or inhalation of anesthetic agents. The drug withdrawal symptom also associated with fever, tachycardia, and hyperflexia. Now, with the empirical antibiotic therapy. Empirical antibiotic therapy. Because of the increasing prevalence of the multidrug resistant pathogen, it is crucial for initial empirical antibiotic therapy to be targeted appropriately. Administers in a sufficient dosage to be, to be ensured bacterial killing and narrowed in the spectrum as soon as possible on the basis of microbiology data and clinical response and continues as long as necessary. Then with the duration of the therapy, endpoint of the antibiotic therapy is largely undefined, in part because quality data were few. If pulses are negative, empirical antibiotic therapy should be stopped not more than 48 to 72 hours because unnecessary antibiotic therapy will increase the risk of multidrug resistance infection. So antibiotic toxicity. So Beta, uh, antibiotic, uh, antibiotic toxicity, beta-lactam allergy. So allergic reaction is the commonest toxicity. 7 to 40% of 1,000 treatment courses of treatment, uh, 1,000 treatment courses of penicillin. So nearly 70 to 40% is seen. Red man syndrome, tingling and flushing of the face, make thorax may occur with Parental vancomycin therapy, but is less common than fever, rigor, or local phlebitis, which is due to histamine release. Nephrotoxicity. There is only a little difference among aminoglycosides in terms of nephrotoxic potential. Aminoglycosides do not provoke inflammation. Thus, there are no allergic components to any manifestation of aminoglycoside toxicity. And the autotoxicity. Aminoglycoside causes cochlear or vestibular toxicity that is usually irreversible and may develop after cessation of therapy. By the time patient complains of hearing loss, the toxicity may be more than 60%. Hearing loss due to vancomycin is better described as neurotoxicity, manifested, uh, manifested as auditory nerve damage. The so important pathogen of critically ill patients the list of important pathogens are the first one, vancomycin resistant enterococci. The next, Staphylococcus aureus. And the third, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Fourth, multi drug resistant enterobacteriaceae, including Klebsiella species. Five, Streptococcus maltophilia. And the sixth, Axinobacter. Bowman complex. Thank you. So these constitute surgical site infection. So the lecture completely covers about the antiseptic techniques and importance of the antiseptic techniques. And in when we when the antiseptic techniques have been have been not followed, and there is a high chance of surgical site infection, which has been followed in the following uh, lecture. So this, um, this clearly denotes the importance and how to manage the surgical site infections. Thank you.